It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of March 20th, 1998. We've got six movies to look at today. So let's go ahead and jump right on into it, and we'll start off with the political dramedy starring John Travolta and Emma Thompson, Primary Colors. Primary Colors, vibrant and funny. Oh, hi, dog. Oh, mister, you're about to become Mrs. From Mike Nichols, director of The Birdcage, comes the story of a man of the people. It was supposed to be handled just right. Just right. And the people. Yeah! Who made him the man. Does this guy have a chance in how? No. Newsweek Graves, it's a work of art. Primary Colors, rated R. Starts tomorrow at theaters everywhere. So John Travolta plays uh, Jack Stanton, basically kind of a Bill Clinton-esque type of person. He's running for president. The election is seen through the eyes of this young guy named Henry Burton, who's played by Adrian Lester. And along the way, he has to uh, Stanton has to deal with the sex scandal, which um, pretty convincingly happened around the time that everybody realized that the president was sleeping around with somebody in the White House. And it's funny because Bill Clinton actually enjoyed this film so much that he invited John Travolta to, to, the, to a party on the one condition that he's got to come in character as Jack Stanton, and Travolta denied, and probably that was for the best. Um, uh, despite the fact that the stuff that was going on behind the scenes, this was actually a nice return to form for several people. Uh, John Travolta had a couple of misfires here and there in the, in the early 90s, and then that was this was still in the middle of his big comeback in the mid-90s. But more importantly, it was Elaine May, who Elaine May had just come off of, um, was still coming back after what happened with Ishtar. Uh, him, her and Mike Nichols worked on The Birdcage, and then this film, which actually got her an Academy Award nomination for writing the screenplay for this. And the movie itself is very funny. You have a concept here that's basically a parody of something like what happened around Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign, which was originally pu published as Anonymous but was later revealed to be written by a Newsweek journalist named Joe Klein, who was covering Clinton's campaign in 1990, and that was revealed in 1996. And uh, the movie itself is a pretty funny movie. I like seeing John Travolta in this. Emma Thompson's playing a character kind of different than what we're used to seeing her, and I think she works very well off of Travolta. You have a cast that also includes Billy Bob Thornton, Mara Tierney, uh, Larry Hagman, Kathy Bates, and uh, Adrian Lester, who are really good in the film. It's a really good film. It kind of got put an underrated appreciation. It's got it's gotten a much better appreciation after kind of underperforming at the box office when it came out. It was heavily acclaimed, but it's a movie that has held up well over time. I was not really looking forward to it when I first saw it the first time, but I gotta say I was really impressed by it overall. I thought it actually was a lot better than most people gave it credit for. And while it's no Wag the Dog or Dave, some of these great political comedies we've had in the '90s, it's a pretty good film. And um, if you liked uh, Mike Nichols' other, the comedy he did before this, The Birdcage, this has a lot of that same kind of humor to it. Maybe not as memorable as something like The Birdcage, but it definitely has a lot there to recommend. And I definitely say check it out. It's definitely worth a watch. So, um, so that's Primary Colors. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is Wild Things. We've come to the halfway point of our senior seminars. <laughs> Our guests today come from the Blue Bay Police Department. Why don't we begin with a question? What is a sex crime? Not getting any. Welcome to the town of Blue Bay. Hi, Mr. Lombardo. Girls. So where's your house, Mr. Lombardo? Where innocence can seduce. He started rubbing my shoulders. Accusations can destroy. I'm innocent. You guys do sex crimes, right? When was this that Sam Lombardo gave you the ride? Did Sam Lombardo rape you? Yeah, okay, he did. He pushed me to the floor. And appearances can deceive. Kelly said that we should do this to hurt Mr. Lombardo. She found out that Mr. Lombardo was in love with her mom, and that was it. Say you! Say you! You know how my mom's paying you off? She's breaking my trust. We bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Now they're getting away with $8 million of Sandra Van Ryan's money. You want my gut? There's more to this story than you know. Woo! After tonight, the three of us are not to be seen together again. After tonight? I was curious about how you see things working out from you and Sam and Susan. Susan? I mean, it's hard enough for one person to keep a secret, let alone three. Especially when two of them are in love. You don't really think Kelly and Sam are going to share that money with you, do you? 
Sure, nothing happens but after that scene with Denise Richards and Nev Campbell that made me and every other teenage boy and every, every and everyone want to rent that movie to see what happens afterwards for some uh, moments that our parents probably would not want us to watch. Surely nothing happens after that. Um, hmm. uh, let's talk about Wild Things because it is it's something all right. It follows a. Uh, yeah, Matt Dillon is a high school guidance counselor in South Florida who's accused of rape by two female students played by Neff Campbell and Denise Richards. And there's a series of subsequent revelations after a police officer begins investigating the alleged crimes. You could pretty much tell where everything is going just from the clips I showed you there from that trailer alone. But, um, Wild Things, I won't say, is a great movie per se, but it definitely has moments that make you want to watch it, i.e. the stuff with Neff Campbell and Denise Richards when they were looking at their pure hottest back then. I mean, Neff Campbell was coming off of the screen films. She was still on Party of Five. Denise Richards was just in Starship Troopers. And um, there are some pretty intense sexy scenes in this movie that make the movie wa watchable just because of that. The mystery is not really all that surprising. If you've seen what happened, if you've seen a little bit of the trailer there, I mean, you pretty much get a good idea of where it's going to transpire. Nothing is really that much of a shock in this movie. And... It's not really a great movie per se, but at the same time, I'll give it credit that it is a passable film. It's a passable film that only gets by because of those those hotter scenes in the film, but other than that, though, it really doesn't do a whole lot to make it really worth the watch at the end. I mean, when you I mean, the mid credit sequence is where the big twist is revealed. Like, the, like you don't usually do the twist in the middle of the credits. Like, usually it's before the credits, and it's just like... It's a weird move, and you could tell why it just doesn't work in this particular case here. Like, the mystery is not all that interesting whatsoever. The thing that is kind of pushing it uh, to another level besides the obvious scenes, uh, the obvious sex scenes, is the performances. Like, Kevin Bake is pretty good in the film. Matt Damon is pretty good in the film. You know, Nev Campbell and Denise Richards are very good in the film as well. You have Robert Wagner in here, Bill Murray, uh, Teresa Russell, Daphne Rubin Vega, Terry Snodgrass is in here. I mean, there's a good cast involved in this that actually does make it worth it in the end. And I won't say it's a good film per se, but it is a film... It's a kind of a guilty pleasure in a way. It's not a perfect film. It's not really that great of a film, honestly. But the stuff that makes it memorable makes it memorable in the end. And that's pretty much the only thing you do remember from, what, from the film once you're done watching it. But, uh, yeah, other than that, though, this really doesn't have a whole lot there that makes it unique or different. But... It does leave a lasting impact on you if you see the scenes that are, this film is notoriously known for. But other than that, though, nothing too crazy about the film itself, though. So um, that's pretty much all i got to say about that one. That's Wild Thing. So let's move on to the next movie here, and that is another Jackie Chan movie, Mr. Nice Guy. Another one of Jackie Chan's movies that came from um, Hong Kong to, to America through New Line. You have Chan playing a Chinese chef who accidentally gets involved with a news reporter who films a drug bust that went awry and is now being chased by gangs who are trying to get the videotape. And you have Richard Norton starring in the film as well. Um, kind of like with the other New Line dubs for this, they take out a lot of stuff from the movie. It receives mostly a partial dub with a brand new score attached to it and 13 minutes of cuts were made. Most of it this time revolving around the violence. Uh, particularly the violence against women in particular, and cuts for pacing. There were scenes that were rearranged, and there's one notable scene rearrangement, and that's the opening scenes of Giancarlo killing Tina and Jackie's cooking show. And the opening version opens with Giancarlo killing Tina, then Jackie's cooking show, but New Line's edit opens the other way around to give the movie a lighter tone from the start. And 
the new line edits were not really the best thing about these movies per se and they may have brought people into the theaters but definitely people did not like the fact that new line made so many edits to this like new line i get what they were trying to do they were trying to get the pacing going a little bit more but at the same time it kind of hurts the ebb and flow of the film when it when you're taking way too much out of the film and then you're actually leaving a lot of empty spaces there where you don't really know what the hell's going on and if you ever seen the original cut of the cuts of these movies they're a lot better but the new line cuts not so much the fact that they spent six million dollars doing the cuts for this is pretty it tells you a lot what, about the movie here but the film did pretty well it did decent business it brought in well, it brought back double the budget on the, it was to do the edits, so $12 million, which wasn't that bad, honestly. And um, as far as the film itself goes, it's just a, fu it's just a fine movie. Um, I, think the, I think the extended cuts of these movies are a lot better, but at the same time, these are the movies that are helping to get Jackie Chan into the zeitgeist because later this year, New Line's going to put him in a movie with Chris Tucker called Rush Hour, and that's going to bring Jackie Chan to the next level of his superstardom at this point, and, and, uh, yeah, not much more to say about that one, that's Mr. Nice Guy, so let's go ahead and move on to the next movie, and that is M. Night Shyamalan's Wide Awake. Remember grade school, when you had your best teacher, met your best friend? What do you think about her? She's okay. Hold off your greatest pranks, faced your first bully, I can't. Why? felt your first loss, and found your first love. He's hot. I think I'm having a biological reaction. <laughs> Remember what it's like to experience life for the first time. Rosie O'Donnell, Dennis Leary, and Dana Delaney. That's not funny. Is that funny? Wide awake. See, this is what happens when you don't get M.I. Shyamalan a twist to work with. Uh, you get a pretty mediocre film. This was actually Shyamalan's second film as a director after Praying with Anger, which came out six years prior to this, and just before he had started his... his he had started this tr track to becoming a hit director with The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable, starting with the next year. The script was actually written in 1991, and Shyamalan himself described this as a film that he hoped that would make people cry. The film was made in 1995, but was not released until 1998, which pretty much tells you everything you need to know about how this movie fared out. I mean, it's not a bad movie per se. It's not like one of those bad movies that sits on a shelf for a number of years, but it certainly is not a good film whatsoever. It's a film that it tries. It's a story that is pretty much pretty much your typical story. You've seen stories like this done before, but the casting overall isn't bad here. Dennis Leary, Dana Delaney, uh, Robert Loja, Joseph Cross, Cameron Mannheim, Rosie O'Donnell. Everybody in this movie is doing a decent job here, but... Again, it's nothing too spectacular. It's nothing like that we haven't seen done before in many movies like it before. I will say it's interesting to see M. Night Shyamalan do a movie that's not like the M. Night Shyamalan we're used to seeing. This is a straight-up comedy. This isn't one that has to have the twist in, that, that make it, is to make you want to see the film. It's a film that's very interesting and a different take whatsoever on a, on a number of levels. So for that, i got to give him a lot of credit for that. But as far as the film itself goes, it's passable. Maybe good for a one-time watch, but other than that, not, not not much more after that. So that's Wide Awake. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is Fireworks. So this is a Japanese crime film, and you have uh, this guy named Yoshita Yoshitaka Nishi, and Nishi leaves the police in the face of harrowing personal and professional difficulties. He ends up spiraling into this depression and starts making questionable decisions, like what you see in that little clip there. And uh, first released in, in Japan in 1997, directed by Takisha Kitano, who's also in the film. He's also known as Beat Takashi, and uh, he's actually the guy who plays Yoshi Yoshitaka Nishi. And uh, that's pretty much all I know about this movie per se. I don't, I've never seen this movie before, but I don't know it too much about it. It did win the Golden Lion at the F Venice Film Festival in '97, and it helped to establish Katano as an internationally acclaimed filmmaker. And the film has helped develop a cult following since then. And uh, since this film came out, he's directed stuff like Kikajuro, Brother, Dolls, Satoshi, uh, some notable films in, in Japan. But um, that's pretty much all I know about it, per se. It sounds like an intriguing premise, honestly. Uh, but I don't know about the movie itself. I've never seen it before, so I can't really say if it's any good or not. It has some good reviews for it, so... Might be one I might definitely check out one day. Um, not much more to say about that one, so let's go ahead and move on to the last one we have here. And that is Robin Tooney and Henry Thomas in Niagara, Niagara. Could you not point that gun at us, please? My name's Seth. I'm Marcy. It's cool. Seth and Marcy are falling in love. Sorry. <laughs> but love can't be controlled. Hey! Come on. 
Sorry. 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 Niagara, Niagara, rated R. Now playing New York and LA. Starts Friday in selected cities. So this is a dark and tragic romantic tale about young love, drugs, and a cross-country trip, as well as Tourette's syndrome. And um, that's really all I know about it because, again, this is one I've never seen before. I know that this director did a movie that I know I am very familiar with. Um, I hope they serve Beer, Beer in Hell, which was the last movie he directed in 2009. You see Henry Thomas in there, Robin Tooney, Michael Park, Stephen Lang is also in here, Candy Clark, uh, Clea Duvall, uh, some notable names in here, but... Um, as far as the film itself goes, I don't know if it's any good or not. I see that it got mostly mixed reviews here in America, but overseas it got better reviews and was actually garnered a Best Actress Award for Robin Tooney's performance at the Venice Film Festival, the Volpe Cup Award, and has fallen into cult status due to its underground popularity. So it might be something that could be good. I don't know for certain. I haven't seen it before, but uh, judging by that, possibility that it could actually be a little underrated gem but other than that though that's pretty much all i know about it so that is niagara niagara and so with that said we wrap up another edition of time about the movies we'll wrap march off on the next episode with nine movies in general like most eight of them are mostly new releases and then we have a re-release that was actually the big new release of that weekend the re-release of greece we also have the Newton Boys, we have Ride, we have the infamous Meet the Deedles, the Victors, the Visitors 2, the Corridors of Time, the Proposition, not the Nick Cave Proposition, uh, No Looking Back, Character, A Price Above Rubies, and Eden. So, nine movies to look at overall next time around. It's going to be a packed episode, so we'll deal with that next time around. But until then, uh, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, Please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So, with that said, I am off, so thank you for watching, I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.